This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. So we set out to um, ask some, a very specific question, and that is whether or not we could determine whether or not there were any differences that we could detect between living neurons between humans and bonobos and chimps. We'd like to record from them. We'd like to see their activities. It's very hard to do. You've heard about, uh, obviously, all the ethical issues and complexity issues of doing that. Uh, and there are obviously some, some caveats to uh, leading into it. But this is our, our aim, is to look at the individual um, cell level and then build up from there to see how these cells functionally interact with each other. Now, uh, some recent technology uh, has developed that has allowed us to approach this project. And so for the last uh, couple of years, we've been involved in attempting to develop some strategies that allow us to look at live human uh, and great ape neurons. And this is a result of a, a remarkable discovery by uh, Shinya Yamanaka in Japan. And what he discovered is that you can take somatic cells, skin cells, and grow them up in culture dishes. And if you add uh, four very specific genes to those fibroblasts, the fibroblasts will reprogram themselves into embryonic stem cells. And from those embryonic stem cells, one can then generate through a variety of protocols, neurons and other tissues as well. So this would be the thought we had that we would go to being able to look at live neurons. These are called uh, induced pluripotent cells. And we've done this successfully in human cells and we began to collect fibroblasts from the great apes. So obviously, I'll start off by telling you all the caveats. I mean, I'm aware of the uh, restrictions. You know, this is in a culture dish, right? We're going to miss all the nurturing part that goes into the development of neurons. Diet, we're controlling that, actually. The cells, all the cells are going to get exactly the same diet as they mature. Uh, not a lot of social interaction. <laughs> not, not bad, but you'll see. But not, not, They miss the in vivo context, although we're, we're considering some ways to do this. And really, uh, even if we find differences there, what's the relevance of an in vitro measure for the in vivo behaviors that we're looking at? So we're aware of these limitations. But nevertheless, uh, are the differences that are detectable at a cellular level uh, relevant to our understanding of human origins. And we pose this not as a solution in a broader sense, but as a new tool or a different tool to ask these uh, specific questions. So overview is we're going to show you, I'll show you how we derive these cells and uh, how we differentiate them into neurons, give you some evidence that they actually are functioning and we can uh, examine them. And then we'll ask whether or not they recapitulate any of the basic differences that others have already discovered. Can we recapitulate those differences in the dish? And then I'll give you one example of a variety of uh, observations we've made that are provocative. So derivation, uh, you know, there are differences in terms of the number of chromosomes between humans and chimps. There are very specific sequence differences, for example, in mitochondria. Uh, in chimps and, and humans that we can look to see whether or not they're recapitulated. And then we'll look at the reprogramming factors. Or when they are reprogrammed, do they reprogram in the same manner that the human cells reprogram? And as they are, are what about the differences in differentiation? Do they 
Are they different in the initial process or their capacity even to differentiate using the exact same technology and the same conditions? So the cells grow as fibroblasts in much the same way. Uh, they look very much the same. We use these factors, and it's another whole other discussion how and why this, this, this reprograms, but just suffice it to say we're taking advantage of, of this uh, ability. In all cases, uh, the fibroblasts do reprogram, and from those reprogrammed clones, we can pick individual clones, and generally 10 or so clones from each patient, and expand them uh, as individual clones from each individual person. And we can do this successfully for uh, bonobos, chimps, and humans. I'll, report, I'll be reporting on uh, six human fibroblasts, and these are human embryonic stem cells derived independently also of humans, and we have two bonobos and two chimps that I'll be talking about uh, today. So they do contain the appropriate uh, chromosomal structure, so the chimps and the bonobos have 48, and the humans have uh, 46. Uh, at, as Pascal uh, alerted us to, there's a very specific, although the size of this sequence within the mitochondria of human and chimps the same, there is a DNA structural difference in this area. So we used primers, which were common to both, and amplified the DNA and sequenced it, and found, in fact, that the chimp sequence corresponds to the chimp, the bonobo sequence corresponds to the bonobo samples, and the human corresponds to the human. So we're keeping our samples correct, and they're recapitulating their functions. All the molecular uh, reprogramming markers, and I'm not going to go into some detail of this, but uh, when we do reprogram them, uh, the bonobos, the chimps, and the humans all express the same genes as they are reprogrammed. And as we differentiate each of the subjects' uh, cells into uh, what are called embryoid bodies, and then characterize for whether or not the cells within that embryo body have differentiated into three major lineages, they do that. So we have ectoderm, mesoderm, and endodermal markers evidenced in the embryo bodies. So they're differentiated appropriately uh, in the same way under, the, under similar temporal uh, constraints. Next, we have developed over time conditions uh, using specific factors that allow us to differentiate the embryo bodies now into neural rosettes, which are the, uh, a precursor, almost, almost um, early, like uh, taking on the structure of a, a node cord. And those can be dissociated then and differentiated over a period of time into neural progenitor cells, which are DAPI positive, SOX2 positive, and they proliferate as basically neural stem cells. And at this stage, we're not finding any differences between our subjects. At that stage, we, we isolate the progenitor cells and begin the extensive differentiation into mature neurons to determine whether or not they have any, uh, whether or not they can differentiate into neurons. At the early stages, they begin to grow processes, they extend uh, axons, and as they mature, we can uh, look at the morphological characteristics of the cells, we begin to see that they, they not only extend processes in dendrites, they make synapses, and they make spines. We isolate, we, we can characterize the neurons uh, by using a virus that expresses GFP under the promoter of a mature neural marker, and we, they, we can then isolate cells, they express nicely in all the subjects, and then we can patch clamp the cells with electrophysiological recording to determine whether or not the cells uh, elicit action potentials, and are they, are they spontaneously firing action potentials in the culture dish. And we're still in the process of doing it, and in fact, we have not been able to find differences between uh, any of the primates using uh, this basic technology. Now, clearly, we're gonna be looking deeper with new techniques and different techniques as we pursue, pursue this, but they're all living neurons, they're all connected with each other, and they're doing quite well. So what are the, some of the known differences that have been found between the two uh, functionally, and are they recapitulated? We see, uh, this was a discovery made by Ajit, and we've collaborated with him over the years on this, uh, and he uh, discovered that, he and his colleagues, that new 5 gc uh, an enzyme that places acetylic acid on a protein, 
uh, is missing or mutated in humans relative to the primate, so you sh that enzyme is not present. And this occurs at this branch point, so we are alone in not being able to uh, have this functional protein. When we differentiate our cells into neurons and look for the expression, this is uniquely expressed in the brain, we find in chimps and bonobos are neurons expressing this enzyme, but it's absent uh, in humans. So we can recapitulate this phenomena for future investigations into mechanisms. A very interesting discovery was made some years ago that there's a splice variant in a protein that is neuropsin, which is thought to be involved in spine formation, and there's a, a splice variant in humans so that they make two versions of this particular uh, protein, which is different from chimps and bonobos, and this is from their original paper where they have the two splice variants being shown in humans and in placenta, and here are all the different species that they uh, tested that don't have that splice variant. We took our uh, samples, and while there is the single variant in our chimp and bonobos, we have the splice variant evident in the human, which allows us another vehicle to go after this in, in, in some way. So in the first part, what I've showed you is there are, that we have character, character typically normal, neurons express differential markers, and they are actively uh, neurons in the dish, and many of the normal differences or the predetermined uh, pre differences we can recapitulate in this uh, setting. So can we highlight any other differences? What, what are the things that we might expect to see given what we've heard already about uh, how extraordinarily large the human brains are? Would, would that give us any hint as to some of the things that we might be looking for? Well, to look for differences, one, one general strategy is to search for gene expression differences. And this is really one of the exciting things for those of us interested in cell and molecular biology, is that we're looking not at post-mortem tissue to look at dead RNA samples, but rather living cells. And we're looking at the activity of the expressed uh, genes. Uh, so we'll, we've, we've taken a, a several approaches. We can do this by microRNA, microarrays, um, with uh, sorted populations for specific types of cells and looking at uh, mRNA. We can do deep sequencing for really a, looking at non-coding RNAs and, and, and much more of a uh, broader uh, approach to RNA. And we can do proteomics, meta metabolomics, and lipidomics. But I'll tell you one story with the microarrays. And the way we do this is to differentiate the cells into neurons. Uh, and then make triplicates of these uh, samples and put the RNA, uh, cDNAs on arrays and determine on these arrays where there's tens of thousands of genes that can be interrogated, whether or not there are any differences between them. So we have multiple replicates so we can look at the differences between them. The data that comes out then can be analyzed not just on the individual gene basis, but we can uh, there, there are algorithms that allow one to cluster the genes into uh, functional categories to see whether or not they're important. And we're, I'm just showing here 15 biological processes that are well above an odds ratio of, uh, of two or three. So think of these as standard deviations. So these are clusters of genes that are six, odds ratios of six, five, uh, greater differences between humans versus bonobos and chimps. And what these uh, categories here mean that there's a cl cluster of, say, 25 genes that fall into something involved in cell uh, movement. So we looked at these high uh, difference genes. What we come up with is a very interesting observation. That is that cellular movement, uh, cell adhesion, cell migration, taxis, are all uh, features suggesting some mi migration or, or motility difference that might be intrinsic to these cells. So we've been setting up assays to look at function uh, of these living cells in these motility assays to see if we can find anything uh, there. So here's one assay where we let the cells go into confluency. These are neural progenitor cells. And then we scratch the surface, separating the two populations of cells from each other. And then, um, and you can see from, it, it clustered very uh, 
quickly together, hard to determine. So the alternative is to use the retrovirus to label just the sampling of the cells. Then we can do areas of uh, analysis where we can measure only one cell at a time and look at directionality as well as uh, the rates of migration. When we do that, and we can then stratify the cells, uh, zero plane them, and get an idea of uh, just the directionality and the numbers of cells and, and whether or not they're targeting. And with thousands of cells being analyzed, what we find is that there's an interesting pattern of difference that occurs in humans. While the hum human neurons are focused in their pattern of migration, the chimp and bonobo cells generally are, have a broader uh, array of, of directions that they're traveling. We've done this uh, also to look at uh, the length and the speed at which the cells travel. And now we're, this is looking at thousands of movies, uh, well, I should say t uh, 20, 30 movies for each uh, animal, and then thousands of individual cells are able to track. And when we plot this, what we see is that uh, the average velocity uh, over, over time is much faster in the, pri in the primates than it is in humans, statistically by, by uh, a great amount. And this can be seen in another way. So here we have um, the total number of cells uh, on human versus apes are significantly, the mean velocity is significantly faster. And if you break it out by individuals and uh, 20 or 30 movies per individual, the apes are, are, are significantly faster in terms of their migration rate in vitro. So I'll leave you with this, with the idea that we are uh, we, we're beginning to develop uh, assay systems using uh, living cells that allows us to, uh, care, to uh, extract uh, new information about RNA, about the anatomy, and about the functional characteristics of the cells, and we're developing new uh, assay systems that allow us to determine whether or not the genes that we do find out that are different are functionally important in the context uh, and, and within the limitations that we have. So um, we're, we're beginning to find these cellular differences, as I just uh, summarized, and we, we, we believe that this will be a useful additional assay system within which to look for differences uh, between living primate neurons. And of course, we need to thank a lot of people that have put a lot of time into these studies over the years to get us to the point where we are right now, building our in-house zoo. Uh, Carol has been uh, a leader in the lab uh, uh, on, in this program and uh, initially started out with us, and Allison now has his own lab. And uh, the, the technicians in the lab have been tremendously helpful and, and, and inspired by some of the questions that we're able to, to ask here. Thank you very much.